so a very good afternoon to all of you so we have this interesting panel discussion which is basically understanding the evolving wealth landscape and let me be very clear it's not understanding the evolving wealth management landscape we are talking about wealth how is wealth being transformed in india and globally over these few years and we have a very distinguished panelists with us who have been into this industry for for decades and they have as told collective vision of maybe more than more, more than 150 years so we, we would like each of the panelists to first introduce themselves and also tell us how are they associated with wealth hello uh, good afternoon uh, my name is sandeep bagla uh, i have been with uh, the financial markets or capital markets for the last uh, 29 years uh, i have earlier worked with mutual funds like reliance mutual fund icici group aig mutual fund principal mutual fund i have managed fixed income assets and equity assets uh, currently i am the ceo of trust mutual fund uh, trust mutual fund uh, is a mutual fund promoted by the trust group which is in turn promoted by utpal and nipa set uh, utpal set is was uh, is a ceo of rare enterprises which is rakesh junjuwala's uh, flagship company and we have been associated uh, with the financial markets and we have been a part of the growth story that is india uh, on which we are all uh, you know all thriving and uh, we are making good so our association has been with the indian story at we have seen the indian story at very close quarters and that is our association with the indian wealth thank you hey good afternoon my name is ravi sharma and i come with a mixed bag of experience uh work with company called hawkins launch bpl appliances uh work as a head of marketing for videocon was a sales head for birla sun life mutual fund sales and service i was ceo for aditya birla mari when we were the largest uh, <coughs> excuse me largest uh, the wealth managers non bank owned and now i run my practice in australia based in melbourne and we also advise uh, small and medium enterprises but i keep connected with indian mutual fund market and therefore Here I am before you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Anthony Heredia. I have spent about 30 years in the fund management industry uh, across multiple firms: Aditya Birla, HSBC, Morgan Stanley. I currently work with my colleagues at Mahindra Manulife. Uh, we are a small mutual fund company. Hopefully, we will become large over time with the help of many of you in this room. Uh, my perspective of wealth is from a variety of angles obviously uh the first perspective is managing the wealth or managing for creating wealth for our investors across multiple firms the second paradigm is obviously working with so many of mutual fund distributors like you in the room to help you further your businesses of meeting clients aspirations of creating wealth and so hopefully over the next 35 40 minutes we share perspectives and conversations that help you in some form or the other uh, engage with your clients in the future hi my name is suresh soni i'm ceo of baroda bnp pariba mutual fund and like many of you been in the mutual fund industry for a while about 30 years to be precise i have done multiple roles through this period managing money as a fund manager then cio and then of course the current role uh from a wealth management perspective i think uh, you are essentially the conduit which takes the products that we create or solutions that we create to the client so in that sense it's extremely important to recognize the role that you play and work with you so that all of us collectively are able to serve the end client which is the investors in the end thank you great so we have this distinguished panel and i'll ask a very basic question and it's open to all the question is how has wealth as a concept evolved in india over the last decade so when you started your careers there was a different concept of wealth 
today maybe there is a different concept of wealth so what what have you seen from where to where anybody would like to answer a uh, very interesting question i think a uh, lot of us have been uh, conditioned to survive and india is a fairly capital deficit country and in 30 years we have seen so many changes that you know it's not easy to really uh, you know enumerate all of them but i remember let's say 20 years back when you went outside india uh, you let's say you go to a place like london or new york uh, you were fairly second class uh, citizens or tourists you were not seen in a very high esteem that i think has changed in a tremendous tremendous way you have today uh, the multinational companies like google or microsoft or so many other companies where the ceos are you know indians i think the india uh, as you have known that the gdp has grown in a tremendous way today we are the fastest growing country uh, in terms of gdp growth uh, in within india also i think people have realized earlier it was completely bent on bank fds and the idea the emphasis was on protection because the indian corporate sector was not really going anywhere uh, in such a rapid clip and now the thing has changed now i think the risk appetite of uh, the indian investors have changed uh, today in the morning i was seeing uh, there are so many programs on wealth management how the importance of sips how the importance of mutual funds uh, i think the mutual funds have become uh, you know the poster boy of uh, participating in equity markets and the growth markets in a disciplined manner and which is you know taking care of the risk at the same time buying quality stocks which ensures growth over a long period of time you know there have been stories so many stories where people have burned their hands when you know investing in direct equities and you know in trading and you know options and futures there was a study recently which uh, showed i think more than 95% of people are losing money consistently in uh, options and derivatives so i think mutual funds has emerged as the main stay for wealth creation and of course now uh, people are uh, have are taking mutual fund returns for granted and now are trying to diversify into areas uh, where they have little knowledge and uh, i hope that you know in with the plethora of aifs and pmss and uh, exotic funds eventually i think uh, you know probably the core portfolio should still be in mutual funds and you know uh the 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 satellite portfolio or the peripheral portfolio could be in the experimental products but i think the risk taking attitude is uh, has increased tremendously and i think uh, the amount of opportunities which are there uh, i think we have moved from a zone of survival to a move uh, where people are now aspiring for wealth creation i think that is a huge change i think you like to add yeah, so i go down the memory lane when we introduced uh, fast forward sip anthony and we were colleagues and uh, uh, you know coming from consumer industry and seeing what was missing and i told them like we sold color tv those days i said if the vada pav wala cannot invest in a mutual fund the industry has not matured till then because that's how the color tv were sold so if you look at consumerism as briefly sandeep mentioned that consumerism has to come in but people have to get satisfaction and i take it to australian perspective where we also deal with the investors who are relatively you know quite well known and it's a very very regulated industry there are only about 14000 uh, financial planners in australia and it has come down from 27000 so regulation is the another key to overall process regulator will never look at the market development i think which organizations like mp etc would do but that is where uh, people like you come in in a in a major way want to educate as to what to do in difficult times i was talking to somebody in chennai the other day the first time they got six sips in 2002 or 3 in templeton this gentleman used to be with templeton and he says they celebrated in the office and today look at the sip is the chart there so i'm sure industry is really coming of age but people involved with the industry will have to continue to really impart their you know knowledge and bring it about great so and is what has how has wealth changed so i think let me just 
touch on some multiple paradigms on which I think it has changed. Uh, the first is that aspirations of people have changed, right? It's not no longer a bad thing to talk about the fact that I want to become rich. Maybe 20, 30 years earlier, culturally, people would be uncomfortable talking about money or even meeting their distributor and saying, actually, mujhe ek crore ko das crore karna hai. Today, everybody's conversation centers around how do I create wealth. So I think the first thing to recognize, even if your client does not say it to you, aspirations of the average client has changed dramatically towards the wealth that they want to create. Number you are in a situation where your client is a mini advisor in itself. I mean, we used to jokingly say that every Indian is an amateur fund manager because everybody thinks they know which stock to buy, which stock to sell. But now that you could extend that argument to every investment product, every investor that is coming to you for distribution or advice has his or own view on which fund is good, which fund is bad. And so you have to be very, very careful that Actually, I think the role of doing a successful business in today's evolving wealth is actually to keep it simple, right? Because the idea is that you actually have 4,000 different mutual fund schemes, 2,000 different AIF products, 500 PMS products. But the reality is that equity is one word that creates wealth over the long term. So in some ways, one of the best ways to manage for wealth, I would believe, is to focus your business on simplicity. How do you narrow it down to five or six firms that you work with and maybe eight products that you have your clients buy that eventually creates the wealth aspiration for them? I mean, to me, that is one of the clear evolving things of wealth that everybody is trying their best to create products to entice you to sell to their customer. In doing so that if you take the bait I think potentially you do harm to your practice and you do harm to the customer. So I think keeping things very simple because life has become very exciting is another evolving uh, form of paradigm of wealth that I would say. The last thing I'll just touch on, and I'm sensitive on time, is I think conceptually, if you step back from the wealth discussion, India is at the cusp of a massive breakthrough from an economic standpoint, right? It's one thing to say that we will grow from three trillion or three and a half trillion to six trillion. To me, for all of us in the room, actually the larger opportunity is the fact that per capita income of Indians will change from 2000 to 5000 dollars, right, over the next decade. Does it mean that people are going to spend twice the amount of money? The answer is not. Which means that the amount of money that your existing investors or future customers have to devote to potentially creating wealth is going to expand many fold. So I would say that your other concept of wealth is got to be that everybody in this room, including ourselves who run firms, uh, it's not about thinking about can I grow my business at 20% CAGR for the next 10 years? The question should be, there's an opportunity that suggests that you should be growing your business 5x or 10x. 2x is going to happen because of compounding anyways. Markets will double in the next 5 to 10 years. So if you have 50 crore AM, it's going to become 100 crores. If you have 10, it's going to become 20. Your customer is going to have double the money to invest that they had in the last 5-10 years and you will find through technology ways to find more customers. So I think you add that up and you have to start thinking that the evolving wealth should mean for you what is the amount of wealth you are managing for and that concept of 10x should start becoming your central focus of thought. Sure. So a couple of things. One, I think when I started my career back in 92, we used to equate share market as Satta Bajar because every now and then you had regular scams which kind of made people say that you don't go there if you're a serious investor. From there, the attitudinal shift to say that I'm willing to invest in equity. So from trading to investing and realizing that this is a market which is well regulated and can create wealth is a huge mindset change. Second point, just expanding a little bit on what Anthony said. See, 25 years back, our per capita GDP was $400. Today, we are $2,500. That's a six-time increase. Now, over that period of time, the mutual fund AUM has grown about 60 times. 
imagine if the same thing were to happen at the same pace in the next 25 years per capita gdp probably grows from 2500 to 12 to 15000 dollars but the size of the assets that the industry manages will probably grow another 40 or 50x from here so the opportunity is a lot bigger than what we can kind of mentally think of at this point of time and the drivers are very clear when you are at 400 dollar then it's only roti kapda or makan uh, if you were even prior to that then it used to be like anaj nahi milta hai in my childhood the movies that i used to see were all some sau car trying to kind of uh, keep grains inside right from there to a situation where you don't even hear about some of these things to a situation where you have surpluses and then of course getting on to a country which from low income to goes to middle income to a developed country so the transformation that is happening has huge potential for us the only thing that i would always stress is uh, there are simple and inevitable tools of making money and there are complex and unpredictable tools of making money we just need to probably choose the first it's not so hard to make money it's just hard to stay disciplined at it yeah great so uh, my next question it's also open to all panelists is how is technology reshaping wealth management industry and what is the role of digital platforms robo advisory in the current scenario and what do you think their future role would be over the years anyway i i can okay uh, let me start this time so i i have some controversial views on this uh, you know it's very fashionable to talk digital it is very fashionable to talk technology but i think the only technology or digital that works for me as a business owner and i think should work for everybody is technology or digital that actually is useful to the customer experience just having lots of bells and whistles in your proposition 80% of it doesn't make any difference to me is you know very nice in terms of form but not really in terms of substance number 2 i think the way i look at the role of digital and technology also is in terms of the access to information that your investors have i talked about that earlier as well you are going to be under examination by your investors far more in the next coming years because through technology or through digital your customer is being fed with constant information about where he or she should have invested or where he or she made money and you are going to be constantly questioned every time you have an interaction so to some degree using or being very careful about whether the work you are doing is actually adding value the aggregate returns that you are producing for the client etc that i think is a role that technology will come to bear the third aspect is i think you have to be also very very careful that while robo advisory etc may be talked about even in developed markets till date there is not yet a successful robo advisory that has thrown out the traditional distributor and to my mind one should never get scared of what happens with these fintech platforms what happens at the end of the day investing money is a personal thing the role of a mutual fund distributor let me give you a perspective from an amfi angle right it are all the people sitting in the room here called traditional distributors the answer is yes but i can tell you that 95% of transactions that happen in the fund industry today happen without paper right so it's not about saying that oh i need it to be on a mobile app the reality is as long as it's convenient to transact whether it's a link that's provided or etc etc so i think you have to be very confident in yourselves that there's enough technology that you are putting to bear to make sure your customer experience for your clients is equal to any experience they would have with any such robot advisors or etc and what you bring to the table which no robot advisor etc will ever be able to do is the personal touch right it's i'll give a very simple i'll end with a very simple example irrespective of any information you have if you are not well the comfort you get by actually visiting your doctor versus going online and getting an online consultation is very very different right i think that same difference is relevant in the wealth 
distribution space and it will remain so. So, you know, uh, uh, the analogy that Anthony mentioned, that we, we are also called financial doctors. So, typically, here you have to distinguish between a distributor or a financial planner. Because distributor is kind of only looking at short-term objectives of looking at how much returns can he make or things like that. Whereas uh, in terms of, and I will give you a little touch of Australia because you have so many people of, uh, you know, talking about India. So there we look at a very, very long-term objective. A statement of advice is made. You have to look at various objectives. You also look at what kind of milestone money or things like that does he need for any responsibilities, so on. We also look at the risk cover. So it's not just typical to wealth management, but is risk covered or not properly? And therefore, the technology, coming to your question, comes and plays a, a, a good role. And I agree that robo-advisor will not be able to take away anything because it has to be a combination of uh, personal and typically, there's no satisfaction like a client satisfaction that when he looks at you and you tell him that things are on right track, we always tell clients there, if the market is up, I will not call you. If the market is down, you don't call me. So when we look at the overall plan, you look at the overall plan, just don't go by day by day. I, in fact, tell people, uh, and these clients have large sizable amounts, and we tell them that, look, when we have a plan, when you are running a marathon, you are not looking at how is 100 meter being run or 200 meter being run. You look at the overall, and therefore a short, medium, and long-term strategy needs to be considered fully. And we charge decent money. I mean, I charge up to $5,000, $10,000 for a, an advice. But typically, and that's when he has to see, he is coming to a specialist, and you're not talking to, and therefore technology. Role. We have RAP platforms, uh, but we use them very, very selectively, and they're quite a large platforms. And you know, there's, we are talking about six hundred billion dollars only self-management uh, funds. So technology will play a role. Technology will come handy to satisfy clients, but uh, will it replace people? I doubt so. Anything to add? In Yes, yeah, so I think technology is very, very important in terms of increasing your reach and I think it will keep on adding new clients. So a lot of new clients who would have earlier stayed away or who were not being served, I think technology is going to help in reaching them and helping them to access the uh, financial markets. So I think technology should be looked at something very positively for expanding the market. Also, I think in terms of uh, execution, whatever can be executed on a technology platform, it's uh, reducing your work. So your work should be now looking more as a knowledge partner for your investors, where you are able to add value by not only specifying what things to do, but also what not to do. So you are now becoming a more of an advisor role where you are advising clients what to do, rather uh, than only you know, getting caught up in the short-term uh, focus or in terms of selling the product or execution. So I think technology is very crucial. And other aspect of technology I would like to, you know, uh, to, to highlight is that you, are, you can now reach out to a larger mass of people. So there's a whole range of, you know, financial influencers. In fact, I saw one financial influencer who said, Ki, you know, people are lazy you are investing at 6% in a bank FD by going to a single bank. If you make the effort, you go to another bank, you will make 12%. If you go to 10 different banks, you will earn 60%. So this is the kind of advice which is being given and which is being consumed by people. Now, you, are, you should embrace this technology in terms of social media and perhaps put out some content. You know, get some basic training if you are, you know, to, to understand the nuances of uh, the newer channels like Twitter, Instagram, and be there. I think that will help uh, a lot in terms of reaching out to the newer clients and for better financial information getting disseminated. Sure. 
So I'll just state a couple of points. One, I think, uh, just from a global perspective, IKEA, all of you, uh, you would have visited, sells you knockdown furniture, which you can take home and assemble. Now, a study was conducted globally, and on an average, it is found that about 70% of people would call a carpenter to fix it. There will always be 30% who will go buy the tools, try to fix it. If a short word lag jayega, to wo alag baat hai, but there are people who will try to do it by themselves. Uh, interestingly, in investment advisory business, it is about similar. So even after introduction of direct plans and you know, accessibility of mutual funds, in US about 70% of investors yet use an advisor. So there was a study conducted to try and understand that if it is available cheaper directly, then why do people come to an advisor? There were essentially three pillars that emerged. First one is that everything that we do with money gives us instant gratification. Ice cream, karido, movie, jao, you'll immediately enjoy. Investing is something where you don't get immediate reward for the setting aside money. And therefore, it doesn't occur naturally to people. So to motivate to invest, advisor comes in. So that's the first utility that we bring that no machine will be able to bring. The second, of course, is uh, there are people who start directly. I think everything goes rosy, fine, but there is one day market dropped 10% or there is a week in which market dropped 20%, 25%. Your screen is not going to tell you what to do. You need an experienced voice. You need somebody who says, this is going to happen, this will happen, this is the nature of the market. Please hold through it. I have seen previous cycles like this or somebody who brings you well prepared so that you don't get scared. The so second is to handhold through the period of volatility. And the third finally, which was again, a lot of people express is that they said, my situation is unique. I have to send, send my son to university in five years, or I have this goal where I want to acquire this business, or I want to set up a business, buy a house. And therefore I need something customized for me. So giving them a bit of a goal orientation, trying to create something customized. So those are the three utilities that clearly came out for which people did not mind paying. So it's for us to figure out, while technology will be a great tool, what is the value proposition that we are holding, even as technology becomes very widespread or accessibility of the products become very common. So I think what holds true is that despite all the accessibility, there is going to be a serious value that we bring to the table. It's just that we need to keep sharpening and harnessing it. Great. Uh, yeah. So, uh, my next question is basically on risk management. So, in the current economic environment in India and globally, what are the best practices to follow to manage risk for a client's portfolio? If somebody can throw light on me. I think the volatility of the market is not new. The risk is only when you act on it. Otherwise, it's not realized. I think the price of the house you own will rise every other day. Do you act trade on it? Similarly, I think uh, risk is something that you actively convert volatility by your action to be a risk. Otherwise, it's not a risk. It's the nature of the market. And I think the the one thing that we always need to tell people is that to be successful in market, you need bifocal vision. The, the glasses which come with two sides. So the long term is what will make you money, but you need to be able to see through the short term and survive it to stay for the long term gain. So for surviving the, and getting the reward of long term, you need to weather through or live through the volatility of short term. And that's essentially something which is more uh, education and involved exercise for individual as opposed to trying to say one size fits all or do this or do that. I think all of you are experts at it, but it's just that we have to create a plan which allows people to stick through to enjoy the fruits of the compounding over a period of time. Anything else anybody would like to add? So I think uh, the most important risk management tool that we have uh, is the asset allocation plan that you devise with your client. And I think the second most important thing is sticking to it. 
So because returns, see, as long as the client is able to generate a return which comfortably beats inflation uh, from the fixed income part of the portfolio, and I think 60, 50 to 60 percent of the household income should be in fixed income, which is giving regular income, and that can that may be mutual funds, that could be bonds, that could be FDs or provident fund or pension fund or the insurance company. Uh, so that I think should be very clear that if 50-60% of the portfolio is in the safe assets, then the volatility of the portfolio will itself come down. Now, in the 40% that you're allocating to risky assets, where the volatility of the mark to market could be different in different years, then I think out of that, 25% should be in large caps. The rest, 10 to 15%, 15 to 20% can be in small caps and mid caps. I think if you agree with your clients, okay, this is what has worked in the past, for the last 20 years, and how this portfolio has actually been able to you know, reduce volatility and give a good return, then I think the, the 80, 70, 80% of the problem is taken care of. The risk management is already done. And after that, you have to just ensure that you stick to the asset allocation and periodically rebalance it. I think if you do that, then a lot of these questions when the markets are going up or going down, they will not trouble your, your, uh, your investor. And I think you, you will be able to advise them quite soundly. So uh, what we do there is uh, attitude to risk. So there's a questionnaire we ask clients there. The idea of any investment is that, uh, you know, health is most important, more than money. If you don't survive, money is of no use. So we always tell them that, you know, every investment should pass the pillow test. If you're able to sleep tight at night, then that's a good investment for you. And that risk can vary from person to person. And therefore, best to answer. Obviously, then you provide him all solutions with regard to the assets, uh, you know, allocation, so on, what would happen, what would not happen. But there is no, uh, we call it TMD, target market determination, which is by the manufacturer, the product is given, but then you decide how much to give. It's similar to what a doctor prescribes for your uh, rosuvastatin should be 2 mg or 10 mg or 20 mg, depending on how much can you take. So similarly, when you are advising, you have to advise how much can a client take, and therefore, that becomes pertinent. Great. So my perspective on this is, I think risk management is perhaps one of the most powerful tools for everybody in this room to differentiate yourself to the client, right? Because at the end of the day, the reason the client comes to you and uses your services to buy product it, does the client not know that these funds exist? Does the client not know that equity is the best long-term way to create wealth? The client knows all of that. What the client, however, always does during the journey is every time there is volatility, the client potentially panics or gets too excited if the volatility is on the higher side. And behavioral risk, as you would all recognize, is one of the biggest risks that investors have in terms of not creating wealth. And managing that risk in your practice with your clients probably will add far more brownie points in your customer experience journey that your clients have with you than anything else, right? Just all of you cast your mind back to the customers any of you convinced in March 2020 not to panic and redeem. Would that client today not be more grateful to you than any client that you have pushed to invest in the last one year. And what is that? That is just purely risk management. That is managing behavioral risk saying, listen, there is volatility, markets have fallen. This has happened before in 2008 in the financial crisis. Lots of you would have done different things. So to my mind, risk management is something everybody in this profession should definitely focus on and concentrate because that to my mind is what a client comes to us for. Making the plans, all of that is all good enough. But if we, for example, know for, just as an example, that small caps are what clients want to buy. Everybody wants to buy a small cap fund. Are we able to use, for example, technology and tell the client, by the way, you already have 30% of your portfolio in small caps. And historically, in the last 5, 10 years, eventually everything converges. So please don't do anything stupid and put the remaining 70% also into small caps. That is risk management, right? 
of the client portfolio. So I think you've got to think about it in terms of how do I use that to enhance my client experience and outcome as opposed to just saying that risk management is boring technical term, perhaps doesn't have any relevance in my business. It's for the fund houses to think about it. Great. Uh, my next question is something which we are all grappling with. And it is what are the unique wealth management needs of the younger generations? The millennials, the Gen, Gen Z, so what are their needs and how can advisors who may not belong to the same age group as those people cater to these people? Okay, let me start. I think the first learning that we have had is, I think the language they speak is English, but it's a different kind of English or Hindi. Right. So <laughs> I think what you would use as a typical conversation with a 40 or a 45 year old client or a 60 year old client will not work with somebody who has just got money off their first job even if that salary is competing with the 45 year old so i think learning to speak that language i'll give you one example so about a year back we actually partnered with an advertising agency whose only credentials when they, they basically manage all our social media and digital marketing their only credentials were that till date, they had never done any work for a financial services company. Now, you may think that's very strange. Why will a finance company take somebody who has never done work? The reason was they only did work on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So they understood the young audience. They said, you teach us about mutual funds. We'll teach you about the young people. And we will create messages that the young people will actually listen to and think about. If you want to convey your normal if I looked I looked at all your ads and none of these people would actually respond so the first thing I think would be how do you tailor your conversation to a language that they understand N number two see we all are bought up unfortunately none of us have actually practiced it or we learnt it too late right which is that the power of compounding and the power of starting early is massive Right? Unfortunately, we all learnt it in our 30s and 40s, but I would believe that the opportunity to tell these younger generation, rather than focusing on how do I get him to invest or her to invest 5 lakhs and 10 lakhs, if you can get every one of these people to buy an SIP, I think that's to my mind the second biggest and should be the primary hook of trying to get the younger generation. Get a 22 year old to start an SIP of 1000 rupees. Trust me, by the time they are 30, they will be your customer for life automatically across all platforms. If you do it the other way around, saying the person earns 2 lakhs as take home, I must convince them how buying an insurance policy and buying a mutual fund is very, very good and savings is a good habit. I think you are barking down the wrong tree. Any other advice, anybody, for the younger people? So I think we have all... Uh, ready-made models, a lot of us in our own houses, when you have your you know, younger brothers or nephew, nieces or your sons and daughters, I think we must all understand that, that you have to be part of their world uh, to understand their language and their aspirations. And they might be very different from what your aspirations were. Now, you were perhaps thinking when you, the largest investment that you made was probably take a loan and buy a house. They might not think in those terms because they are mobile people. They might not be in Bombay. They might not be in Pune tomorrow. They might be in, in New York or they might be in London. So their objectives are different. So try to understand them, help them crystallize their, their thought process because they at this point of time will not have a very clear thought process about what they want. So, you know, probably trying to understand from your family members and then trying to customize it and understand from the from the new investors who are emerging, I think that would be the only advice that try to go into their world, try to understand their language and try to understand their aspirations. That would be important. Great, great. Yes. You know, my younger daughter works as a clinical psychologist and point, case in point here is her youngest client is eight year old. Now, uh, she also teaches in Monash University and uh, she says, uh, I said, eight year old, and because of privacy issues, they don't talk about many things. I said, eight year old is a little too much. So typically, younger generation, you start looking at, he has a stress of homework. 
Now look at the young guy, yuppish language, things like that, looking at comparisons, looking at other things. And uh, what are you talking to them? Of course you can talk to them in their own language. We did classroom, I think, in CNBC 20 years back when we were teaching what is about mutual fund and so on. You have to also look at how are they talking to each other. Uh, I am part of one of the marketing analytics company here. And uh, the idea to see is there is a three billion Twitter messages or WhatsApp messages or the other messages which are on public, uh, you know, system that you, can, you need to track and you track it on IP address wise, you realize that I come from Nainital. The communication in Nainital is not the same as you do it in uh, Bombay, right? So you have to look at what regional. We are obviously a country of so many uh, languages. And Yapish language in those places is very, very different than what you see here. So therefore your communication has to be such which appeals to them. But I think stress has now become one of the major part as to how when Anthony says about uh, SIP, typically what are you taking away? You're trying to discipline. People also want to take, uh, or you know, youngish people, they want to take a decision. And somebody just mentioned a few days back, we have moved from instruction-based uh, childhood to a discussion-based childhood. I think that discussion works very better with the younger people. Great. Anything you'd like to add? Sir? Yes, sir, just... Uh, not only in the context of new clients, but I think it's important in the case of existing clients as well. Because one of the biggest loss of client happens in practice is when there's a generational shift in the client. So, either he's been too conservative or he's been too aggressive, and that's a difficult part that we need to think about on managing. So somewhere or the other, even the existing client, we need to find a way of engaging the younger one as well, so that over a period of time, that trust builds up. So I think my colleagues have spoken enough about the new generation, but I, their, the access to in information, their, uh, let's say I think at some point of time, your original client had limited access to information, but the new client who's coming in, the younger one, has probably more information than any of us would have. What we need to teach them or what we need to engage them is more about the behavior and overall plan. And starting early, involving the younger one early into that. And also probably re recruiting some people in your team who are of their age profile. All of that helps. Great. So, sir, we'll conclude it by the, by the last question uh, we want to ask on this. Where do you see the wealth management industry next 10 years? in India and globally. And would we be able to reach what US is today or maybe Australia is today in terms of technology, infrastructure, in, in terms of mindset of clients? So are we, are we moving there or we have already arrived there? So I'll take this uh, because when I joined, I came from consumer industry and took a marketing job in Birla AMC. We were talked about those days. And uh, when people really asked about the industry, there was not much. We used to say U.S. has seven times, uh, your mutual fund industry, AUM those days was seven times of what the banking had. And we were probably the 115th of what banks had as a deposit. So the comparison people would not take it. So any change is very, very difficult for people to accept. And I think over a period of time, I see this industry growing. I see uh, people playing value addition to, uh, you know. And when you, when you uh, in the previous presentation, I saw the penetration level. So penetration level is still very low. It has to increase. And, and therefore, I think industry will grow leaps and bounds. So have we arrived? So have we arrived? I think uh, somewhere. Seven years back, we used to have 20 rupees per capita into SIP. Now we have 120 rupees per capita in SIP in about last seven years. Will we go to 1,000? Will we go to higher? Certainly we would go. Uh, I think all of us talk about we being the fifth largest economy. The reality is we are 
on overall size, we are fifth largest, but in per capita, we are at number 127. So there's a huge potential for growth. We have just started getting some people into the fold. Banking accounts are with 80 crore customers. We are with 4 crore customers. Long runway for all of us. So I would put it this way. I think we have all arrived to a place which, like I said before, we can genuinely aspire to have our businesses become 10x in the next 10 years. We've arrived to that point. From a technology standpoint, etc., Deepak, you talked about, I think the technology we use and offer our clients is unparalleled today. I mean, I work with a large global organization. I can tell you the tech we provide, customer experience, there is no market including the US that provides it and I think we have our government to thank for it in terms of the digital infrastructure, etc. So, the opportunity over the next 10 years, I think is a very, very clear opportunity and we have surely arrived at a place where everybody sitting in this room can think about how they business will be 10 times at least from where it is in the next 10 years. Great. So we'll just open the floor for some questions. If you have some questions, we'll be happy to answer. And we'll take probably two or three questions. We are short of time. Your question? So the question is, is it advisable to invest in brands as compared to equity funds? How to evaluate choosing a brand for investment? So what they are basing on, should I choose a mutual fund AMC brand or should I go to the basic which fund to invest? What is more important, the legacy, the DNA or, or it is it's the same? It's a very controversial question and I like to hear. Yeah. So, what happens is ki whenever new teams are being formed, it takes time for the teams to stabilize. So, there are four stages of any team formation. You know, first is forming. So, team form hoti hai. Second is storming. Jabun mein jhagda hota hai. Ki people don't agree with each other. Third is norming, when you set the rules, the norms bante hai. Or fourth is performing. So, it's not necessary that, you know, all the teams which are old, they have gone into the performing mode. But I think for new teams, I think it takes a little time. So, I think just like you allocate funds uh, in between debt, equity, inequity, large cap, mid cap, small cap, you have, probably you have a lion's share, you invest in the established teams, and you experiment with some of the new teams where you think there's a good prospect. Great. Anybody would like to add something? Go ahead, go ahead. No, I just go back to something I said earlier. Uh, don't complicate what is very simple. You buy five diversified multi-cap or flexi-cap funds for your clients. They will eventually in the next 10 years make with a range of 0.5% plus or minus compounded equal to if you spent the next 10 years constantly wondering about which is the best fund to suggest to the client today such that 10 years from now your client will own 53 mutual fund schemes across a range of ideas and from 20 different brands. I am genuinely telling you five funds from five reasonable firms in terms of brand will get you there. My other point this is something I am saying, maybe we meet 10 years from now and you can say what a foolish statement. But brands in investment management are made eventually by investment performance, not by who you are, right? Please think about some of the names uh, today that you are most comfortable with. They are not the most known brands 10 years ago. They are what they are today because of the consistent investment performance they generated. And again, I am reiterating the point, these are not relevant because there is no thing that says this brand will perform in the next 10 years. Frankly, in 10 years time, all the players in the fund industry will perform mota moti around each other. The brands or the firms that service you well, you have a comfort with, stick to five or six, your client's life is made, is my view. So there is no brand alpha? I don't think so. I mean, I genuinely, you take for example, flexi cap funds, 
the average return, let's say, in the last five years is 17 percent. The best person is 20, the worst person is 15 or 14. Now, assuming you threw a dart and you pot four FlexiCap funds, the chances are you would have got 17 percent return anyways. So, so uh, if you don't overthink. So, if yeah. you really see beyond the financial services, talking brands, yeah. see 25 years back, uh, back, which were the top 25 brands? Look at 50 years back, which were the top 25 brands? Do you hear Murphy anytime? Do you hear? So, pe brands who do not change with the time will go into extinct. And therefore, go, I mean, there are people of different ages. 25 years back, you used to buy Bombay dyeing towels. Do you continue to buy, you know, similarly? So those are the brands have to be relevant and they obviously will be backed by the performance. Great. Great. Yes, with this end, we end the panel discussion.